of course, as we delved into the subject and we began to consider why even King Seleucus, the first Seleucid king, would use a symbol from Apollo, it's obvious that as a Greek, he would use a symbol to associate himself with the pagan Greek god Apollo. What was even more curious and astonishing to us and required further investigation was why the Christians would use this by the second century AD, an allegedly anti-pagan um, Jewish-based philosophy would use this. It is even more curious because the Jews themselves had rebelled in the second century BC against Seleucid rulers in their region. Seleucid rul rulers such as an Antiochus Epiphanes would come in and defile the city of Jerusalem, defile the temple, and in an attempt to bring Greek culture to the Jewish world. And so it is even all the more paradoxical that Christians should adopt such a symbol. It is true that Jewish kings in the wake of that successful rebellion themselves would use an anchor, but not as a religious symbol at all, but only as a regional political symbol on their coins, and certainly never in association with a fish. That, of course, would be a graven image in violation of the Ten Commandments. And this, uh, this, of course, got us to ask further questions. How, why would such a pagan symbol, especially one associated with a fish, and therefore a graven, a graven image, an idol, if you will, that would be a violation of all previous Jewish tradition and law, why would that be adopted as the earliest Christian symbol? It's far more understandable that Titus, a pagan Roman emperor, would also wish to associate himself with this same symbol used by pagan kings who were fighting against nationalistic Jewish rebels. He would adopt their symbol uh, for obvious reasons. He associated himself with uh, pagan gods. And the kings that came in the wake of Alexander the Great, such as the Ptolemies in Egypt, were attempting an integration both of local culture, the Egyptian culture, uh, with Greek culture. And in the process of doing that, the Ptolemies created a new god, a synthetic god, Serapis, made out of the parts of Apollo and his son Asclepius, the healer god, for example, and connected that with Osiris, the resurrected god of the Egyptians. And associating all of these different deities, they came up with a new god, Serapis, a healer god, a resurrector god, a god who himself had suffered martyrdom in his guise as Asclepius and gone on to an apotheosis as a god. To use the precedence of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids makes sense of course for the Flavians who are coming east and conquering the same region. For it to be used by Christians is harder to explain. And why Clement of Alexandria would only point to such pagan symbols as proper Christian images is itself a paradox. And of course the Romans used Alexander the Great, one of the first great uh, imperialists, as their template it is quite understandable. Roman emperors were close students of the entire Alexandrian view of conquering the world. So that they would look to, to Ptolemy and they would look to Seleucus to find out, uh, to, to use and, and, and copy the kinds of symbolism and the kinds of cultural integration that they used to conquer the territories that they became uh, rulers of is completely understandable and we understand why the Romans would do it. They have been doing it and studying Seleucus and all the other uh, Alexandrian uh, tactics for conquering co uh, other nations from the beginning of the Roman Empire. And more than that, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids were keen on integrating their own native Greek culture with the local cultures that they'd conquered. And so Serapis is a good example of a synthesis, if you will, of the deities from two different cultures. And this is in effect what the Romans themselves are attempting to do, bring unity to a multinational, multi-religious empire and bring ideological unification, just as the post-Alexandria and the Hellenistic rulers of the Middle East were doing, and so they would serve as the natural models, the precedents for Roman emperors to use. And it wasn't just the Flavians. Uh, Hellenistic kings, uh, the images used by them were used as early as Augustus, if not earlier, by Roman emperors. And the Titus uh, and Titus and Vespasian often quoted 
Serapis on their own coinage as well. Oh, thousands of coins can be seen with the Emperor Vespasian or Titus on one side and the god Serapis on the other. They were the new, not only Jewish messiahs, they were the new Serapis. And the, and the god Serapis is himself an interesting figure, melded together between Apollo, Asclepius, Zeus, and Hades, the afterlife god, as well as Osiris, the god who had himself been torn apart and resurrected, makes it clear that Serapis was a resurrection god. Asclepius, his, if you will, his divine ancestor, etymologically, if you will, or historically, was born of a mortal and the god Apollo and lived a mortal life. He was a healer who became so successful at healing that he was able to resurrect the dead. This vexed the gods. He was struck down and martyred, so he suffered a martyrdom on earth, but his divine father Apollo asked that he be made a god. And so Asclepius himself was resurrected and enjoyed an apotheosis to become a god. Now, none of these elements are elements that would be found in any Jewish god or any Jewish, any Jewish religious idea at all, of course. So that these would be present in Jesus, all of these elements, all of these qualities that you find in Serapis, who was himself a fusion of two religions at, in the wake of conquest a perfect example for the Romans to follow. And here, all of these qualities in Serapis, this fusion god, are now found in Jesus, where no Jewish culture or tradition would have, to, would have placed them. Before the first century, the concept of Messiah was a very common one in Jewish thought. They had experienced messiahs before military and political leaders who had led them to victory, such as in their war against the Seleucids, the Hanukkah Rebellion. Uh, but of course, Messiah was never associated with a divine being. Judaism is a monotheistic religion, so their Messiah would be a man. He might be able to form, perform miracles or do wonders, but he would certainly be a mortal, a human being. He wouldn't be a healer. He wouldn't, well... Why would he specifically Specifically be a, healer? a healer and a resurrector Although ideas of reincarnation and resurrection were certainly entering Jewish thought by this time, before the first century, no Jewish messiah was ever thought to be a God-man. That would be a affront, if you will, to Jewish monotheism itself, much less a God-man represented with idols or graven images, such as the anchor and dolphin. Yes. It was part of the Hellenistic uh, right. influence that, that the purest Jews were exactly trying to avoid and what they were so fearful of happening to the Jewish culture was they had to defend themselves against the infiltration of Hellenistic uh, ideas into their own religion, which is what one of the causes fell of the war with Rome. Right. Despite the sectarian nature of Jewish monotheism, and you can hear it in the Ten Commandments itself, the Jewish God is a jealous God who will have no other gods before him and will tolerate no images of the divine, no idols, no graven images. And yet, despite the sectarian resistance to foreign influence that you see in ancient Judaism, nonetheless, influences from other cult cultures. It's well known that, the, for example, the Persian Empire had influences on Judaism that were already beginning to affect them. And certainly Greek culture, despite Jewish resistance to assimilation, was already influencing important Jewish philosophers, such as Philo uh, of Alexandria in the first century AD. He did not understand Messiah as a God-man either, but at least he was starting to integrate the ideas of the philosopher Plato and, uh, the, and, Jewish, and Jewish religion into an integrated whole, and looking at Hebrew scripture in an allegorical way, very much as the New Testament does. There are aspects of late Jewish literature, such as in the book of Daniel, which suggests that perhaps there'd be a resurrection of the dead, but this was not universally accepted by Jews in the first century. And Daniel itself is probably expressing an influence from foreign uh, cultures, such as the Persians, or perhaps even the Greeks at this point. Uh, but Daniel was not universally accepted as canon by Jews in the first century. And there may have been many Jews. In fact, Josephus and Philo describe certain sects of Jews as believing in either a form of resurrection, or an afterlife, or perhaps even reincarnation but it was certainly not universally accepted by Jews in the first century.